Again, just to introduce myself, I'm John Gardella, and uh, I've been doing these uh, history talks for three years now at the COA. I'm a retired high school teacher. Uh, today we're going to be talking about uh, the history of Korea, and, uh, which, is, which is an interesting history. Um, I actually learned a lot in preparation for this talk, things that I didn't know. Um, and so I, I hope you learn some things and, and find it to be interesting. Um, it's obviously been in the news a lot. I'm going to talk more about the history leading up to modern times, and then we'll discuss uh, modern times at the end. So the agenda, the essential question, isn't really an essential question today, but I, th I thought, um, since we all know quite a bit, about modern Korea, or at least have heard quite a bit, it might be interesting to share what people know. So uh, what do you know about North and South Korea in the 21st century is the question that we're going to be discussing uh, after, after my talk. The agenda, we're going to have a brief introduction and talk a little bit about the geography, and then go back uh, to the early history of Korea, the uh, uh, Joseon period, 1392 to 1896, the short-lived Korean Empire, the independent Korean Empire, uh, Japanese colonial rule, 1910 to 1945, the division of Korea after World War II in 1945, and then North and South Korea in more modern times, and we'll have our discussion. So as they say in real estate, Location, 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 okay? When we looked at um, European history, we looked at World War II, we saw Poland being, you know, between Germany and Russia. And, you know, two large powerful nations and really having a, a hard history because of that. And the same could be said for Korea. Uh, located, you know, it's a peninsula, but located between China, or really northern China, uh, Japan to its south, and then to the east, of course, is, is Russia, maritime Russia. And this geography, this location, is going to have a large impact on Korean history. So the Korean peninsula lies in Northeast Asia, the Yalu River separates Korea from China, and the Tumen River separates Korea from northern China, Russia, and Russia to the northeast. About 70% of Korea is covered by mountains, so it's very, very mountainous, and the arable land tends to lie in valleys between the mountains. Archaeologists believe that the first inhabitants to the Korean Peninsula um, came, migrated about 50,000 years ago. And they came from Central Asia, uh, not, not from China, but from Central Asia. Uh, Koreans are nationalistic. They're very, very proud. They've had to fight throughout history just to maintain their culture. We'll talk more specifically about that um, as the talk goes on. Um, the Koreans in both the North and the South believe in one Korea. They would like to have a unified Korea. And we'll see that they've actually had, Korea has actually been unified for a pretty short period of time at different intervals throughout their history. Never a long period of time. They would really like to be unified. The early history. During the Stone Age or Paleolithic, Paleolithic era, hunters and gatherers, and, and this history is really similar if you're talking about European history or in uh, Central Asia, it all starts off pretty much the same Africa. You have hunters and gatherers who eventually uh, learn um, techniques for agriculture. They settle into farms, farming, growing crops, settle in villages, based on families and clans, and then come up from there. Bronze Age weapons and pottery began to appear about 4,000 years ago, about 2,000 before the Common Era. Now the uh, Gojan uh, was established in 2333. This is according to Korean history, by the way, by Dangong, uh, who according to legend was the offspring of a heavenly prince and a bear woman. 
Don't get excited, guys. It's B-E-A-R, woman. I saw a bunch of heads pop up, you know. What's the next slide going to be? No, it's, it, um, so, and, but both in North and South Korea, to this day, they uh, celebrate the National Foundation Day um, as it's a, it's a large holiday based on, on this legend. Gojian was first mentioned in Chinese records in the 7th century BC, and its capital was moved to Pyongyang around 400 BC. We're going to see the capital of Korea is going to move around quite a bit as we go through. Korea at this time was made up of several, several political entities or little kingdoms which engaged in, in trade and war. By the 4th century BC, the leader of Gojong was referred to as the Han or the king uh, and was often at war with the Yan, where, which was the tribal groups in, in China, in northern China. Attempts at to alter Korean history have been made by both modern Japan and, and modern China. They've tried to rewrite Korean history, which is sort of leave, really minimizing the Koreans' role in their own history, which is, which is really upset the Koreans, as you can imagine. Now, the three kingdoms. In 57 BC, the kingdom of Silla was founded and ruled southern Korea. Silla, along with Goguryeo, I went on YouTube to try to learn these pronunciations this morning, so we'll see how I do, and, and Bakcha made up the three kingdoms. Uh, Goguryeo, often referred to as Goryeo, Gor was translated in English as Korea, and that's where we get the, the name Korea for the name of the country. Fighting between the three kingdoms led to the weakening of Goguryeo and the Chinese creation of the four uh, commanderies of Han and adopting Buddhism in 372. And we're going to see that Korea will adopt, they're going to adopt Buddhism and Confucian uh, ideology from China. In 527, after the Common Era, Silla adopted Buddhism, and in 672, Silla ex expelled the Chinese from the peninsula, completing the unification of the three kingdoms. So on the left is a, uh, a map of uh, Gregorio, and you can see that it's not just the peninsula that it was controlling, but way up into uh, what we would refer to, most of us would refer to as Manchuria, or northern, northern China. And then on the right are the four commanderies of Han, which were military colonies set up by the Chinese Emperor Wu and ruled for about 600 years uh, in, in northern Korea. Gregorio, 936-1388, after the Common Era. In 935, Silla, after years of fighting between northern China and the regional kingdoms, finally surrendered to Goryeo. In 956, the emperor of Gor Goryeo, uh, I spelled it wrong there, but that's okay, forced major land and slavery reforms, and, and in 958, he implemented the civil service examinations. Now, these were also adopted from China, and China, the Chinese uh, emperors had initiated um, civil service exams, and we know that some of you probably have taken a civil service exam in the United States to get a government job. It was the same thing here except for they were extremely rigorous exams that uh, were, for the most part, based on Confucian ideals, ideas, and um, were very difficult to pass. But if you could pass it, and you pass it with a good score, you've got a really good government job. Um, and so the same thing is going to be adopted in Korea. This period, which was also known as the Golden Age of Buddhism, was effectively, Buddhism basically became the, the national religion, if you will. Um, and also, during this time, Buddhism achieves its, its most influential, um, or the most influence on Korea that it will throughout its history. After fighting wars with the Sui Dynasty in, in China, and three wall wars with the Kitan Leo dynasty in northern China, Goryeo built a thousand li wall, and they said the Sui were going to pay for it. <laughs> so, so, 
So anyway, um, it's on its northern border. Well, it didn't, it didn't work, surprisingly enough. Um, in 1231, the Mongols invade. Now, the Mongols had actually uh, already taken over China, and they're going to be known as Yuan Dynasty in China. Uh, and they, they uh, invade Korea, and they sign a peace treaty uh, in 1270. And this is what the Mongols typically did, was they had no real desire to rule a place, they weren't there to say, okay, you're all going to become Mongols, you're going to follow our traditions. They didn't care about any of that. What they really cared about was tribute, money. And as long as you gave them money, they also were very interesting, the Mongols, is that they, they were there to learn from the people that they conquered, and they would take their scholars, they would take their tradespeople, and bring them back to Mongolia and have them teach the uh, Mongols so they could advance their civilization. So this began about an 80-year period of Yuan uh, overlordship where the Koreans paid tribute to the Yuan dynasty. Then in 1388, General Yi Xiongji, later will be known as King Taeyo, led a coup d'etat against King Yu, leading, uh, leading to the downfall of the Goryeo and the founding of the Chozon dynasty. Now, this is a brief, brief overview of early Korean history. There are so many dynasties, and this is taking over that one, and the you know, positions of the, of the uh, capital are being moved around. Uh, so I'm just trying to give you the, the sense of, of what's going on here. Chozon Dynasty, now 1392 to 1896. So really long, long period of time. The Chozon was the last Korean dynasty and the longest ruling Confucian dynasty. Uh, Confucian ideology adopted from China was encouraged uh, uh, and became entrenched in Korean society uh, while Buddhism was losing influence. Now, Confucian uh, ideology really stresses doing your duty, paying your honor to elders, obeying the rules and laws. So this, uh, kings tended to love this. You know, it, it, the rulers really enjoyed uh, promoting Confucian and ideas because it really led to support uh, of them uh, as well. Yi Zhongzi moved the capital from Chosan from Kaesan to modern day Seoul, or Seoul, Korea. Chosan consolidated its effective rule over the territory of current Korea, leading to the height of classical Korean culture. It also had extensive trade, it developed literature, and science and technology. Chosan was weakened during the 16th century by a series of brutal Japanese invasions, and then in the 17th century by the Manchu Qing Dynasty. And so this is really going to weaken uh, the Chosun. Now, why were the Japanese attacking them? Well, Korea was trading with different partners. And Japan, though, during this time period, um, had cut itself off from the West. Um, and we talked about that, uh, the Tagawa shogunate. Uh, but they needed food. They had a very... Um, uh, their population was growing extensively during this time period and they were building up their military and they constantly needed food. So they wanted to trade with Korea for food, particularly rice. The Koreans were at the same time were having a hard time feeding their own people. And so the Koreans were actually gonna try to isolate themselves and trade less, especially with Japan. Well, Japan invades twice and they were pretty brutal about it. They invade through Pusan, which is down in the south. And one of their invasions, as a way of showing their power, cut off the ears of the citizens when they invaded, and they took the ears back to Japan and built, they, they set a mountain of ears from these people that they had, uh, that they had uh, taken from. Um, these invasions led to uh, Korea actually become a vassal state of, of China, where again, they're paying tribute, but in, for protection, 
in, in return for protection. Now, as a result of these invasions, Korea attempted to isolate itself from outsiders and resulting in the West referring to Korea as the hermit kingdom. So that's where this comes from because they, they saw it as a, as, a, as a place that didn't want to interact, so they were acting like, like hermits. The Chosan dynasty, or in the West called the hermit kingdom, 1446, one of the greatest achievements of the Chosan dynasty was the adoption of, the, of Hang, Hangul, the Korean alphabet, which combines the features of uh, alphabetic and syllabic writing systems. How do they do? My, my wife is actually, besides her baking ability, she's a literacy specialist, so she gave me a little tutorial about what I'm talking about uh, <laughs> earlier. And so if you have any questions, Jan will be the one to answer them. Uh, but modern hang Hangul consists of 24 letters with 14 consonant letters and 10 vowel letters. And according to some linguists, Hangul is the easiest language to learn. And I saw the quote that, a, that a, uh, an intelligent man can learn Hangul in a matter of hours and a, uh, an, an ignorant person could learn, learn Hangul in two weeks. So, I don't know. I didn't have time to try to learn it, but that would be, it was kind of interesting. But they said it was, it was very well put together in one of the, um, what term did they use, Jana, for the, for the way it was arranged and everything? One of the most logical systems, I guess, um, in, in the world. Christianity made inroads in China and Korea in the 16th century, but in 1791, the Koreans began persecuting Roman Catholics. Uh, specifically Jesuits, who were really trying to push Christianity on the people. Hangul. So I did learn a little bit. So originally, the language was from the right to the left, top to bottom. Now it's adopted the Western way, which is left to right. And it says, at the conquered COA, the <laughs> gift shop has many great items that you should check out to purchase. Yeah, okay, you, you've already gotten that, okay? <laughs> Excellent. The, uh, my mother actually paid me to give that gift shop, uh, the Congress COA gift shop, a little plug. But, uh, but anyway. Decline of the Chosan Dynasty. As a result of Korea paying tribute, Korea actually enjoyed about 200 years of peace. Now, Silhak, or practical learning, was a Confucian social movement which concentrated on improving the lives of peasants through land reforms. Now the peasants, as in peasants in all civilizations, have the toughest life. It, it's very, very difficult life. And they were heavily taxed because these tributes that are being paid, of course, who's actually paying the tributes are the peasants. Uh, and they, um, at different times, had to pay different percentages of their crops, but including up to 80% of their crops in, at some point, leaving them with actually very little to live on themselves. So anyways, they had land reforms. They promoted Korea's own national identity and culture, encouraging the study of science and techn technological exchanges with foreign countries as well. In 1800, the dynasty was weakened by in-law politics. In-law politics, go figure, right? The, uh, and it's Paul, the, these were struggles, and they went on for quite a while between basically in-laws or relatives of the king in fighting to try to gain power, especially when a, when a king, king died, and that really weakened uh, the Chosan dynasty as well. In 1866, France attacked Korea after seven Catholic uh, missionaries were killed, they actually, it was a gunboat attack, and then they landed some, some French troops on Korean so soil, but they were forced to retreat after fierce fighting. 1871, the United States sent a naval expedition to Korea demanding that it open up trade, right? What does that sound familiar to? Japan, 1853, and uh, Commodore Perry, you know, making the offer they can't refuse. So they um, did the same thing in Korea. 
In 1876, Korea signs uh, a treaty of Gangwa with Japan, granting Japan with extensive trading rights, including extraterritoriality rights. If you remember what that was, that's what the United States had forced Japan to sign uh, around in, in the 18, late 1850s, which basically says that, um, in this case, the Japanese would follow Japanese laws even when they were in Korea, and if they broke the law, they would be tried by Japanese courts, not Korean courts. And the United States and the other European countries that forced this on China as well, uh, these rights. This leads to, in 1882, uh, a, a, a mutiny in Seoul by Korean soldiers because of the nation's modernizing policies. Not really unlike uh, the, the warriors in Japan that were upset with the modernization uh, of Japan. Internal politics between Koreans who favored relations with Japan versus those who favored uh, China also developed, and we're going to, and it's really going to split the country apart. Some some of the Koreans said, "No, we should be, we should be aligned with with Japan," and others said, "No, we should be aligned with China." 1894-1895, the first Sino-Japanese war or Chinese-Japanese war was fought between Japan and China over which nation would hold influence in Korea. So they're fighting over Korea, uh, and Japan won the war. This ended with the signing of the Treaty of Shimonoseki, which was granted, which granted Korean independence uh, from China, but it opened the way for um, Japanese uh, hegemony uh, in Korea. Now, in 1895, Empress Min of Korea was assassinated by Japanese agents after she had appealed to Russia for, uh, for help from Japan. So we have three major powers here kind of battling it out over control of Korea. Min's husband, King Gojong, fled to the Russian legation, or embassy if you will, in Seoul where he remained for a year at this time period. Now, the Korean Empire, 1897 to 1910, um, King Gojong emerged from the Russian leg legation and declared an independent Korean Empire. It's going to be short-lived, but it's, it's one of the times when they were somewhat independent. King Gojong implemented the Guangmu reforms, Guangmu reforms, which brought Western technology and indus industry to Korea, started to bring it in. They instituted standardized weights and measurements, and again, reform the land ownership. The modernization process was interrupted by the Russo-Japanese War, 1904-1905. We talked about this when we talked about imperialism. Actually, I guess it was the, uh, when we talked about Japan and the um, gro growth of ultranationalism, the militarists in Japan. Um, but as, we, as if you remember, uh, the Japanese win. They, they sink basically the Russian Navy in a surprise attack, and Russia is humiliated, which will actually lead to the 1905 re revolution in, in Russia, in St. Petersburg. So Japan wins again. Japan soundly defeated Russia, and the war ends up with the signing of the Treaty of Portsmouth, in New Hampshire, which is hosted by President Theodore Roosevelt, who won the Nobel Peace Prize for his working out the peace structure. Now, the terms of the treaty, again, are not going to go to Korea's benefit. Terms of the treaty included an immediate ceasefire, Russian with, uh, withdrawal, Russian troops withdrawal from Manchuria, and the recognition of Japan's claims to Korea. So from this point on, this is 1905, um, Korea is going to be under, uh, well, let's go on and see. The end of the Korean Empire. In 1905, Secretary of War, William Howard Taft, who of course eventually will become um, president and then a Supreme Court justice, agreed to the Taft Katsura memor Memorandum. Now historians look at it and they, they're not sure how much that Taft actually agreed to in this, but
but the Japanese issued it as, as this memorandum that it was an official document. And Taft claimed, no, he was just having a discussion. He wasn't really negotiating uh, on behalf of, of the United States government. But it, is, it said that peace in the Far East could pre, pre, be preserved if Korea was under the sphere of influence of Japan. Now, if you remember when we talked about um, the sphere of influence was very important um, during imperialism, where there was at least economic control, if not complete um, uh, uh, political control as well. Later in 1905, Japan forced Korea to sign the Japan-Korea Convention, making Korea a protectorate of Japan. And Korea had a weak military. It had started to modernize under the Wang Mu reforms, but it hadn't fully modernized it at all. And so uh, Japan-Korea Annexation Treaty was forced on them in 1910. Now, Korea never actually signed this treaty. Japan, again, wrote up the treaty and announced it to the world without Korea actually agreeing to it. But from that point on, Korea is a colony of Japan. So Japanese colonial rule, 1910 to 1945. And uh, we, you know, we've talked about imperialism before. This actually is a whole nother, whole nother step beyond what we think of as colonies, imperialism. So the Japanese ruled Korea. They created a position called the Governor General of Korea. And he was appointed by the emperor who under Japanese law was required to be a full active Japanese army general. So not a retired one, one that was active in the, in the Japanese army. Now, beyond that, he was independent of the Japanese cabinet or civilian control. So he's getting his orders directly from the Japanese military. And if you remember, the, the growth of ultranationalism in Japan, the military was pretty nationalistic. Um, so this wasn't gonna bode well for Korea. The governor general had complete power, including judicial, police, legislative powers over the peninsula. The rule was extremely harsh and destructive, uh, producing virtually no benefit for the Korean people. Japan still, even though feudalism was over, um, was still very much a hierarchical society. And Koreans were absolutely at the bottom of this Japanese hierarchical society as, as a colony, even within their own country. Japan's rule was highly centralized and they established a huge bu bureaucracy in Korea, even by colonial standards. And I found the, these, uh, these ratios, which I thought were pretty interesting. You probably can't read them, I apologize. But in India, India, the British ruled India with a ratio of one British official or administrator to 28,000 South Asians, okay? In Korea, the Japanese ruled Korea with a ratio of one to 240. Uh, thank you, 420. 420. Um, Japanese administrators to Korean citizens. So it was really, really, really heavy handed. It was, uh, they established a police state, uh, totally suppressing Korean political participation. There was no free speech, free press, freedom of assembly, and no representative governments whatsoever. The Japanese took over the educational system, rewriting Korea's history and denying Korean culture. All teachers, and as a retired teacher, I found this a little interesting, how my students would have reacted. In Korea, the teachers were required to teach in full uniform wearing a sword. Boy, that could have really cleared up some discipline problems. <laughs> And we don't want this to get out. Somebody might get an idea, right? The, um, but anyways, imagine arming teachers. Unbelievable. But Japan established a police state. Oh, I already said that. Japan's purpose for having Korea was basically twofold. One was um, essentially economic, 
raw materials, especially rice and food, and then as a market for Japanese finished goods, which was, we've talked about that before with imperialism. That was typical, typical of a colony to send raw materials and then buy back more expensive finished goods. So the, the cash flow flows to the mother country. All teach, uh, excuse me, there I am again. I can't get over the teachers wearing the swords, I guess. But all teachers were, rec uh, no, I said a third time. And, stage, and the staging area for Japanese military, uh, for the Japanese military to launch invasions against Manchuria and China. A liberal Japanese government did come to power in the 1920s, early 1920s, and some of the harsh rule was, even though they weren't in control of the, um, of the um, governor general, did ease up a little bit, but it didn't last because the ultra-nationalists are gonna to come to power and come down heavy-handed. Okay, Japanese rule during the 1930s. As Japan prepared for and carried out invasions of Manchuria in 1931, and then southern China in 1937, um, all, of the, all of Korea was mobilized and basically forcing the Koreans to assimilate now we talk about today about immigration and having and immigrants assimilating into the American culture, you know, learning the language, maybe changing religions, following the, the customs of whatever for the new country. But here, the Koreans are being forced to assimilate basically in their own country. So to try to become Japanese within, still within Korea. Um, now, of course, the Koreans resisted this, so the Japanese stationed two army divisions throughout Korea. Virtually all key positions in government, business, finance were held by the Japanese. Land ownership reforms, okay, uh, again are being put in, but this time it appropriated large agricultural tracts as food direction was directed to Japan for the benefit of Japan. And by 1930, the governor general owned 40% of all agricultural and forested land in uh, Korea. The government enacted laws legalizing racial discrimination, and the Korean workers were earning you know, one half the pay of Japanese workers. Japan did bring in modern industry starting in 1910 when, with the annexation, um, but again, most of the benefit went back to Japan. By 1942, Korean capital represented only 1.5% of all the capital uh, invested in Korean industry. Just 1.5%, so almost all of it was, was owned and controlled by the Japanese. Japan attempts to annihilate the Korean national consciousness. 1911, the Education Act lowered the standard of Korean schools and closed closed almost all of the private schools in Korea, keeping most of the Koreans illiterate. The goal was to provide, for the Koreans, just to be a labor source for, uh, for the Japan's colonial empire. They burned uh, between two and 300,000 books, including biography, biographies of Korean national heroes and books on the American and European uh, revolutions. Japan rewrote Korean history, eliminating Korea's role outside of the peninsula and in greater, in greater Asia and Japan, uh, basically saying that Korea had no impact on China or Japan whatsoever. Eventually, Japan prohibited the Korean language from being taught in Korean schools and required only Japanese to be spoken and written in all government and large business organizations. Now, this one is one that really got my attention. It's called the name order. And Koreans were basically told they had to change their names, their last names, and make them Japanese. And if they didn't, they would uh, suffer penalties, educational opportunities, employment opportunities, uh, benefits, any government benefits that might have come their way. Um, and Korean families, like, like most cultures, last names are very important in you know, following down through the uh, family line. And uh, so this was really very difficult. 
Korean nationalist movement. So the Koreans are going to, are going to fight back or attempt to fight back. The Japanese prohibited any nationalist-inspired protests, so many Koreans actually left the peninsula if they could and moved to southern Manchuria, maritime Russia, and even Siberia. In southern Manchuria, a lot of the Koreans started farms that were very successful. They actually were making quite a bit of money, and they used the money to put into um, established military schools. I put one here, the military school of the New Rising, uh, in preparation of, for armed independence movements. There were actually several of these military schools that were established in organizations um, to try to fight for Korean independence. In 1919, Korean ex expats or expatriates formed the new Korea Youth Corps and they sent a representative to the P Paris Peace Conference. This, of course, is the conference um, after um, that will come out with the Treaty of Versailles at the end of World War I. And they basically asked the Allies uh, in a petition, and they protest how they're being treated by uh, Japanese colonialism, and they're, they're saying, please help us out. Well, they were ignored by the Allies, including the United States, not wanting to offend Japan and seeing no benefit to themselves. They ignored the Korean request. If you remember, Japan was an ally during, during World War I. Syngman Rhee. Now, in 1909, Syngman Rhee established the Korean Nationalist Association in Hawaii. Um, Rhee had joined an independence club in Korea in 1896 and had been jailed for six years for subversion, during which time he converted to Christianity while he was in jail. After his release, Rhee moved, uh, Rhee moved to the United States where he earned a bachelor's degree from George Washington University, a master's degree in international relations from Harvard, and then in 1910, a PhD from uh, Princeton University. In 1919, when the Cor uh, Korean Provisional Government was established, the KPG, in Shanghai, China, Rhee was actually elected as its first president, uh, uh, even though he was still living in the United States. He wasn't even there. He wasn't even aware of it, but they elected him to be, to be president. So in 1920, he moves to Shanghai, but returned to the United States in 1921. The KPG actually impeached Rhee uh, for embezzling funds, which he was amassing to help independence movements for Korea they charged him with embezzlement, and uh, so they impeached him, so he was no longer the president. But what he did do is he established the Korean Commission in Washington, D.C. to lobby on behalf of Korean independence. Now, all this is going to make him the best-known uh, Korean outside of Korea, um, and he's going to be known worldwide, and, and people in Korea also know who he is. So that's important to remember later on. Case of the, of the 105, or 105. Within Korea, the Japanese harshly repressed Korean independent activities, and in 1911, they arrested 600 members of the Simino independence movement, accusing them of attempting to assassinate a um, governor general. The 600 men remained in jail for a year. Um, until 1912 when 123 were indicted. In the end of the trial, 105 were convicted uh, and executed. They, were all, they all had been tortured um, uh, to, get the, to get the convictions. Now, the Simino disbanded, but several secret organizations made up of political and religious leaders, teachers, and students work underground for independence. Student movements are going to be really uh, important uh, in, uh, in Korea, and we're going to see that they'll actually bring down some of the governments. These are college students that are, that are pushing and pushing for independence. The March 1st movement happened on March 1st, 1919. Huge demonstrations break out across Korea. They are spurred by events within and without Korea. Uh, first, there's the resentment of Japan's harsh rule, 
and protesters were inspired by President Wilson's 14 points. Now, if you remember, the 14 points was what uh, Wilson had um, put forth prior to the end of World War I, and it was actually one of the reasons that Germany uh, in World War I had agreed to an armistice, uh, because they said, well, we're gonna have pretty good treatment here. Maybe it's time to, to uh, stop the fighting and get a decent settlement. Of course, uh, France, Italy, and England aren't gonna go along uh, with, uh, certainly with all of, all of the 14 points. But the, but the point that really stood out for the Koreans was the one on self-determination of states. And they thought, well, this, was, this is gonna help us. Then, within Korea, on the 21st, January 21st, the former king, Gojong, mysteriously died, and rumors spread around Korea that he'd been poisoned by the Japanese. Well, a state funeral was scheduled for March 3rd, and large crowds were expected. So taking advantage, 33 religious leaders, uh, both uh, Buddhist and Christian, decided to write a Declaration of Independence. So here's another Declaration of Independence, you know, really modeled after, after our Declaration of Independence, written by Thomas Jefferson, much earlier than this, of course. So they, they, they write a Declaration of Independence, they sign it, they distribute thousands around Korea, and their goal was to send a copy with a petition to the Peace Paris Conference, just like the Koreans who were outside in China were doing, asking for assistance. Well, at 2 p.m. on March 1st, 33 signers met at a restaurant. Now, they met at a restaurant because they, they knew if they w went public and stood out and, and said, we're gonna have this announcement of the Declaration of Independence that you know, thousands of Koreans would show up and there'd be protests and there might be violence. So they, they said, we're gonna do this quietly at a restaurant. Well, 1,500 people still showed up outside of the restaurant you know, in favor, supporting this Declaration of Independence. And soon it spreads to two million protesters across the country. Japanese reaction, as you can imagine. The governor general was caught off guard, and so he reacts very harshly. By mid-April, 7,500 demonstrators have been killed, 16,000 more wounded, and then 46,000 had been arrested as a result. In addition, they burned houses, churches, schools, and on April 15th, 29 um, people were worshiping in a church. The Japanese locked the doors and burned the church down, killing all 29. The March 1st movement fails under the harsh onslaught, but word of the brutal Japanese colonial treatment reached the outside world through Western missionary channels, and Japan was widely condemned. During this time, the Korean provisional government, the KPG, in Shanghai began splitting apart or dividing over ideological lines. Many were left-leaning or leftist, socialist-leaning Koreans. They were inspired by the Russian Revolution of 1917 and wanted to take military action. The rightists or conservatives nationalists led by Syngman Rhee said, no, we should use diplomacy to free Korea. And it was interesting reading it, and I, I couldn't you know, involve all this stuff and in you know, all this information in the slides, but one of the arguments that he used was, well, we need to educate the Koreans so they can sort of earn their freedom, okay? That was an argument used in um, the late 19th century for African Americans to uh, end segregation to fight against segregation was no, we need to, and it was actually taught at the Tuskegee Institute. The reason why the Tuskegee Institute was formed, it was for higher level training for African Americans, so African Americans could earn their right of citizenship. It's, you know, I mean, I guess in the 19th century you can sort of see the argument, but it's, it's you know, certainly from today's standards, we just see that as, as, and rightfully so, as really 
really pretty awful. Okay. World War II. During World War II, Japan turned Korea into a military support base. Almost all rice production was shipped to Japan to feed workers in the Japanese army. Koreans were forced to live on rough grains such as millet to survive, uh, and a lot of them were starving. By 1943, Koreans were being drafted into the Japanese military, and in 1944, the student vol volunteer ordinance was passed, and uh, Japan started drafting Korean students into the military. This next one you've all heard of, I'm sure, and it's really awful. Tens of thousands of young Korean women, mostly teenagers, were drafted into the Japanese military as comfort women or uh, sex slaves. Now, I won't use the term sex workers. They were sex slaves. And they were sent to uh, military brothels throughout the Pacific uh, to basically supposedly raise the morale of the Japanese troops. Japan has recently, there, there was for years, there was a back and forth between Korea and Japan. And for a long time, the Japanese were denying that this actually happened. In more recent times, they've, they've kind of come clean on it, not, not fully. But by August 1945, some 4 million Koreans, or 16% of the population, were serving the Japanese military in one form or another throughout the Pacific. Now, we usually do, uh, we usually research and try to come up with a goodie based on the topic. But hearkening back to my bright idea when we did, um, when we talked about the expansion of the United States and the opening up of the West and the, um, the Western Indian Wars and Native American Wars, uh, I made hardtack and didn't go over real well. I, th I, th I think the next talk we had like six people here. <laughs> it took a while to build it up again. But anyway, so we started to research um, Korean sweets. And even the Korean sweets that were put online by Koreans were there. Well, these aren't really sweet by uh, Western standards. Uh, so we made ginger crinkles. <laughs> now, ginger is not grown in Korea, I'm sure, because it's. The, yeah. What a relief. I was afraid we were going to have kimchi cooking. Yeah. Well, I, know. Well, I looked it up and the comment was, but these are really not sweet cookies. I was like. <laughs> now, having said that, though, Korean um, food delicacies are delicious. If you, if you get a chance to have uh, Korean you know, kimchi or co Korean beef and things, it's re really, really. Yeah, it's really, really delicious. Um, so please help yourselves. We have a pretty big crowd, so start off with one each, please. And we'll reconvene in about 10 minutes. Kim Il-sung. Now, Kim Il-sung, who was credited as the founder of North Korea, uh, earned his reputation through his military exploits in the 1930s and during World War II. In the North Korean history, if you will, history books, they say that he led uh, you know, multiple divisions in the war against the Japanese, which isn't actually true. What he did lead, though, uh, and not to really belittle what, it, what he did, was he led a small, a small guerrilla uh, group of about 300 uh, fighters in Manchuria uh, fighting the Japanese during World War II. Kim was born on the day that the Titanic sank in 1912, which is just kind of interesting, to a peasant family near Pyongyang. His family moved back and forth several times between Korea and Manchuria. His mother was a devout Christian, which I found to be really interesting. Kim had only eight years of formal education, uh, and he was expelled from school for revolutionary ideas and activities. He joined an anti-Japanese guerrilla group in Manchuria, which was organized and attached to the Chinese Communist Party. Uh, now, uh, during this time period in, uh, in the 30s, when he joined this, of course, the Chinese Civil War is going on. And so he's fighting with the, with the communists under Mao at this time period. 
he rose in, to a leadership position, uses this experience to his advantage when he, when he re-entered uh, Korea, the Korean Peninsula, in 1945. Kim, during World War II, hid out in uh, the Russian maritime, and when Russia formed a military unit of 10,000 men, Kim was given the uh, rank, actually, in the Russian army as a major, in the Soviet army as a major. Uh, of the 88th Special Independent Brigade, and he wore this major's uniform when he re-entered Korea in 1945. And I would guess this is probably from shortly after World War II, maybe 1950, something like that, photograph of him. Now, trusteeship of Korea. Now, as we just learned a little while ago, Korea had been a source of rivalry between Russia, Japan, and China during the late 19th century. And in the 1940s, it's going to again become a source of contention, this time between the Soviet Union and the United States. Uh, the Soviets and Americans agreed that Korea and Indochina should be placed under a trusteeship as they were not ready for independence. Now, <laughs> the, you know, the poor Koreans you know, were obviously very, very, very upset on both the left and the right. So it didn't matter if you were socialist leaning or you were uh, conservative, democrat, capitalist leaning, they were, both sides were upset. Now FDR saw the Soviets in a stronger position in Asia and believed that a trusteeship would prevent the Soviets from taking over all of Korea after Japan's defeat. So this is why he's suggesting a trusteeship. Military occupation. At Yalta, FDR, and if you remember, FDR was really near the end of his life at Yalta and was, was not healthy at all and suffering from, um, I guess what they call at the time, hardening of the arteries, but basically was, was having trouble thinking, especially in the afternoon. And, uh, but he learned that 35,000 Koreans had been trained and thoroughly indoctrinated by the Soviet military. He therefore shifted from suggesting a trusteeship to a military occupation after the war. He proposed a four-way military occupation slash trusteeship, um, and in a minute I'll show you why I'm saying that, made up of the United States, Great Britain, China, and the Soviets. So not really all that different from what was going on in Germany and Berlin, but it was the French and the British, of course, rather, the, rather than, than China. Um, FDR suggested that the military trusteeship would last for 20 to 30 years. 20 to 30 years, and Stalin said, oh, that's, that's way too long. It doesn't need to be that long. Now, the U.S. plan for Korean independence, they saw it as a three-step process. The first would be a joint military occupation by the Allied powers, which I just mentioned. Second, an establishment of a military government under a single unified administration so that Korea would be, all of Korea would be under a unified administration. And then third, transfer of the military government's authority to a provisional Korean government under supervision of the trustees. The Korean issue at Potsdam. Now Potsdam takes place at the end of July, beginning of August 1945, so just before the dropping of the bomb at Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And FDR, of course, has died. He dies in April 1945, so Truman is the president. Now, after FDR's death in April, Truman sent Harry Hopkins, who was FDR's close advisor and, and really a confidant, I mean, very, very close. Uh, Hopkins typically stayed at the White House, um, you know, slept there, and they were very, very um, big influence on FDR. So Truman sends them to, um, to Moscow to discuss plans with Stalin, post-war plans with Stalin. During these meetings in May, and this is in May, not at Potsdam yet, Stalin verbally agreed to the four-way occupation of Korea. During the summer of 1945, the United States was still totally focused on defeating Japan, okay? 
Now, they were working on the bomb, but they didn't know if it was going to work yet. So they're, they're, the invasion plans are, are going on in the summer of 1945. The U.S. believed that defeating Japan and Korea was go actually going to be more difficult than defeating the Japanese on, the, on their homeland because of the mountains. Okay, so they saw it as a really, it was in Japan has some mountains, but that was not where most of the population was. So they looked at it as, as Korea as, as, a, as a really tough place to, to fight. So they said, let the Russians do it, okay, was their idea. So they suggested that Russia fight, in, uh, fight Japan and Korea, and the Americans would fight the Japanese on their homeland, which it had, it had been suggested that we could lose, the Americans could lose up to a million people, a million soldiers. Um, during uh, an attack on the homeland. At Potsdam, Truman heard of the successful test of the atomic bomb and um, said to, said to uh, Stalin, if you remember from my, when we talked on the Cold War last month, he leaned over and said, oh, we've got an, we've got an interesting new weapon. And Stalin just went, mm-hmm. Didn't ask any questions because, of course, through spies, he knew about it. But Truman believed this was going to be a game changer that the U.S. would have the upper hand and that they could win the war before the Soviets entered the Pacific War and keep the Soviets out of Japan and prevent them from taking all of Korea, since we're bringing this back to Korea. Now, if you remember at Yalta, and we talked about this last month, that uh, the Soviets, Stalin had promised to enter the war against Japan, to declare war against Japan 90 days after the Nazis were defeated. So VE Day, which was on May 8th, okay, 1945. 90 days later, it's gonna be August 8th, 1945. That's important to remember. Okay, U.S.-Soviet strategies. The U.S. bombed Hiroshima on August 6th, 1945. Japanese did not surrender. The United States thought they would like pretty quickly surrender, and they didn't. The Soviets declared war on August 8th, again, the 90 days after VE Day, and immediately invaded Manchuria and Korea, North Korea. Not until the second bomb was dropped on Nagasaki on August 9th did the Japanese agree to surrender on August 14th, 1945. Get the first bomb, Russia enters the war, the second bomb, Japan agrees to surrender. By August 14th, the Soviet army was deep inside Korea. Korean attempts at unification. So now we're August 10th, okay, uh, so the day after the second bomb, the Japanese gov uh, governor general in Korea, fearing repri reprisals against the Japanese stationed in Korea, um, sought a Korean leader who could establish a Korean government to prevent chaos. So he starts asking these different leaders throughout Korea if they would take over, you know, set up a Korean government, and they're all like, uh-uh, no way, because they didn't want to look like, they, they were afraid that they were going to be uh, labeled um, collaborators, uh, collaborators uh, of the Japanese. So they refused. But then the Japanese approached a left-leaning uh, nationalist, uh, Yo Eun Hyung, who was a well-known moderate figure with great prestige among Koreans because he was well-known for, uh, for fighting against the Japanese and in fighting for in Korean independence. So he organizes the Committee for the Preparation of Korean Independence, or the CPKI, on August 15th made up of Koreans from all aspects of Korean society, plus both liberal and conservatives. He quickly establishes 145 committees, which were essentially provinces in, in Korea, across Korea, uh, and established a voluntary police force to maintain order. So this guy jumps right on it. He sets up basically a little provincial governments to, to keep chaos from, from kicking in. Now, the Korean People's Republic. In September, Yo proclaimed uh, 
Korean, uh, the Korean People's Republic, or the KPR, as a unified government made up of representatives from all sides of the political spectrum. So he actually now forms a government. <coughs> Now, after the division of the 38th parallel is announced, and we're going to look at that in the next slide, because that is, that's an interesting process in itself, Yo called for an election by the KPR cabinet to choose a president to lead the government. So who do they choose? Syngman Rhee. But they don't ask him if he's willing to do it. So this government, this pre-government led by Yo votes in Syngman Rhee to be their first president, and he turns them down, because he doesn't want to work with socialists and communists. He's, he's very um, conservative, uh, rightist, right wing. The KDP remains strong and would dominate Korean politics. Oh, excuse me, as a result of Rhee, uh, Rhee's refusal, the rightist Korean Democratic Party, the KDP, was formed to fight against communism. Now, the KDP is going to be strong, would dominate Korean politics in the South during U.S. occupation in South Korea. In response, the leftists, the Koreans that are left-leaning politically, socialists, communists, gravitate to the KPR, or the Korean People's Republic, um, in South Korea, setting up real political conflict in South Korea. Bless you. The 38th parallel. So with the Soviets already inside of Korea, the U.S. post-war strategy for Korea, the four-step plan, has essentially failed. With the Soviets in a stronger military position in Korea, Secretary of State James F. Burns strategized that the only way to prevent the Soviets from taking over all of Korea was to establish a demarcation line separating uh, in Korea into, or dividing Korea into a Soviet and American sphere, okay? So we're afraid that they're going to take all of Korea, because we don't have any troops there yet. So um, he suggests, we'll do this demarcation line. The, um, the State War Navy Coordinating Committee, okay, easy for me to say, took responsibility for dividing Korea. At around midnight, on 10th of August, John McCloy, representing the State Department, allowed 30 minutes for two colonels, Colonels Charles H. Bonesteel III and Colonel Dean Rusk, who many of you will have heard of, Dean Rusk, right, uh, to find a geographic dividing line in Korea. So what do they do? They find a National Geographic ma magazine with a map of Korea in it, and choose the 38th parallel. Now, the Koreans were actually very upset about this for a couple of reasons. One, they're being divided up without anybody asking them. But two, the 38th parallel actually had historic significance that the two colonels had no idea about. During the late 19th century, Japan and China had actually discussed dividing Korea at the 38th parallel and, and China taking North Korea and Japan taking South Korea. So, and so the Koreans had known of that plan and were, so this just, this set them off. They were not pleased. You know, as I said, no Koreans were involved in the decision. And to the surprise of the, the United States, the Soviets said, okay, we'll take it. They thought they were, you know, we thought they were going to argue the deal, and they didn't. So 45 to 48, this is kind of a little overview, then we'll get into some specifics during this time period. So the division of Korea was meant to be temporary, but of course the Cold War, and we looked at that last month, especially in, in Eastern Europe, um, is developing, and tensions are developing, polarizing left-right ideologies, and, uh, and these ideologies were also strong in, in Korea, so uniting it was, it was becoming impossible. In North Korea, the Soviets quickly instituted a communist-style government using Yo's provincial committees, which had already been established. So the Soviets come in, and the Japanese governor general said, set something up here in, in Korea, so he did. The Soviets come into North Korea and go, this is a pretty good plan. 
You've got committees set up around North Korea. We're just going to work through them. And that's what they did. So there wasn't a lot of discussion uh, about that, and they could get right to work. Well, in the South, the United States refused Yo's plan because he was leftist, and Sigmund Rhee was saying, he's a lefty, don't go there, don't work with him. But they lacked a plan for their own ruling. So therefore, a struggle is going to ensue between the left and the right, leading to political chaos in the South. And this is, we're going to see this is, this is a real problem. U.S. military take control of South Korea. So on September 7th, this is again, still 1945, General Douglas MacArthur took control, official control of South Korea and appointed General John Hodge with his 72,000 men who were, who were, were stationed actually in uh, Okinawa. They uh, rushed them into Korea uh, to build a military government for occupation. Now, on September 9th, Hodge accepts J Japan's uh, surrender in Korea, and he knows he doesn't have a plan to govern, so he actually asked the Japanese who were there, the colonial governors and, and whatnot who were there, to stay and, and uh, run the country until the United States could get their government up and running in South Korea. Of course, the Koreans just went out of their minds, and you know why, because we looked at the, the treatment of, of the Koreans during the colonial period. So he's forced to quickly establish a military occupation government. Now, who does he turn to? He turns to Koreans who can speak English, okay? And so he asked the wealthiest and best educated Koreans who could speak English, most of whom also happen to be conservative rightists, uh, and members of the KDP for advice and support. And so the United States just goes to the KDP, the sort of the elitist of the Korean society, and, and turns away from Yo's plan, um, and only they, we only recognize the KDP. The U.S. then brings to Korea Singmon Rhee, who has been in Washington all these years. In fact, he's been out of, the, out of Korea for 40 years back from exile uh, to take control, but he's lost contact. He, he really isn't current with uh, the plight of the Korean people. The U.S. government established the Korean National Police in January of 1946, and then shortly after, the, Korean, the South Korean Army was created. And interestingly enough, but I guess not surprising, um, both the leadership positions of the police and the army who were going to be trained by the U.S., most of them had fought for the Japanese during World War II. Judy? They did the same thing in Germany. They did do the same thing yeah, in Germany. That's right. Nazis yep, yep. Um, was yeah, exactly, exactly. Permanent division of Korea. In December 1945, representatives of the U.S. and the U.S.S.R. met in Moscow to discuss, uh, begin discussions on creating a unified Korean government. But it breaks down in 1946 as Cold War tensions really mount. By May 10th, 1948, which I know is a jump of a couple of years here, the U.N. held elections in South Korea leading to the establishment of the Republic of Korea, or the ROK. This is in South Korea. And on August 15th, 1948, uh, Syngman Rhee is elected president. Following right up in September of 1948, the Democratic People's Republic of Korea, the DPRK, with Kim Il-sung as premier, was established by the Soviets. Okay, so we now have two official governments, one in the south, one in the north separated at the 38th parallel. North Korea. The Soviets had chosen Kim because of his strong anti-Japanese credentials, his organizational skills, his ideology, and the fact that he had worked with them uh, during their occupation of North Korea. Kim's leadership was not uncontested, however, and as several of other people who had fought against the Japanese were also looking for leadership positions and really wanted to take over North Korea. 
Kim, though, differed, and this is, this is interesting. The, um, as you may remember, if you've been here for a couple years, we talked about the Russian Revolution and Lenin, and Lenin believed that for the Russian Revolution to succeed, uh, the Russian, most of the Russian people were so uneducated that he needed to have elite Russians basically become the leaders of the um, Bolsheviks and the, uh, the new government, the new communist government in, in Russia. So it was an elitist. And party members throughout most of the time of the Soviet Union were not common workers. They were elites. They were educated. Um, they were certainly ideologically, you know, socialist or communist pure, following Lenin. Um, but those are the people that were accepted into the party, and they received benefits for being in the party. Well, Kim is different. Um, he um, he re strengthens his position by reorganizing the Co Korean Workers' Party, but he's not an elitist. He goes out and recruits people from the masses, peasants, uh, workers, uh, to join um, uh, to join the party, and um, and he offers. He's, they talk about this a lot. He would offer. He'd go into small farming villages and offer advice, and and he was really nice to the people, and you know would you know would shake their hands and hug the babies. He was a real politician, winning support of the of the common people. Um, when Kim took control of the Co Korean Communist Party. In December 1947, it had just 4,500 members. By 1948, when North Korea regime, regime was created, membership had grown to 752,000 members under his leadership. So he had really expanded his power base. Now, Kim's philosophy on North Korea was based on his Juche doctrine. which is a term we're going to spend quite a bit of time looking at through, this is, a, this is really interesting stuff, meaning autonomous subject, stressing self-reliance, political independence, which the North Koreans at first found really attractive, Juche doctrine. Um, Kim's power base was the Korean People's Army, the KPA, which he had organized with the help of the uh, Soviets in 1946. So again, he's got military support behind him. Events prior to the withdrawal of occupation forces. We're going to come back to, to, to uh, Kim in a, in a minute. In 1948 and 1949, South Korea faced many problems, including a poor economy and political uprisings, that left-right struggle. In April 1948, communist rebellion took place on an island off of South Korea. Re called in the military and the police, the special pol national police, to put down the rebellion, resulting in 30,000 deaths. Um, and this is actually just one of many uprisings that are going to happen throughout South Korea. Re next took steps to suppress dissidents, and he even purged the army of 4,700 officers that he suspected were not loyal to him. Um, so South Korea is really unstable. Now, on October 13th, 1948, the Republic of Korea National Assembly, without the Americans knowing this is going to happen, um, voted and requested that the Americans withdraw their forces from South Korea. So all of a sudden, the National Assembly takes a vote and says to the American forces, it's time for you to go. All right? Now, Stalin quickly uh, stated that if the Americans withdrew, he would withdraw from his Soviet forces from North Korea. So Stalin jumps on this, and why does he do it? Well, the U.S. is placed in a difficult position because North Korea was much stronger and more stable than South Korea, allowing the Soviets to easily withdraw. So the Soviets know, Stalin knows that he's got this guy, Kim Il-sung, who's a dedicated communist who's in power, who's got an army. So it's a pretty stable situation politically, which is, sounds funny because our knowledge of North Korea, we don't see it as being a stable place, but politically it, it was pretty stable. 
The U.S., though, believed that if they withdrew, a civil war would break out in South Korea, which would then weaken South Korea and maybe make it susceptible to an uh, invasion from North Korea. So on December 12, 1948, the United Nation voted that the ROK, Republic of Korea, was the only legitimate government in Korea. Okay, so they're saying, and I'm not talking just South Korea, they're saying the United Nations votes and says the Republic of Korea should govern all of Korea. The Soviets withdrew their forces on December 29, 1948, and the Americans facing international pressure withdrew in March of 1949. What was that, 70 years ago? Last month. 1949. The Republic of Korea Army numbered about 114,000 in 1949. Syngman Rhee was strongly anti-communist, and he called for a march to the north. Okay, so he publicly says, we're going to march to the north and take it over. This led to many violent incidents along the border between the 38th, uh, along the 38th parallel between the north and the south, and actually thousands of people lost their lives. This is before the war, the Korean War. South Korea officials boasted that if war broke out, they would eat breakfast in Seoul, lunch in Pyongyang, and supper on the Yalu River. <laughs> By spring 1949, the border clashes had grown to battalion-sized battles, really full battles. The U.S. was leery of Rhee's militaristic actions. They don't want a, another war in Korea, so they're trying to to tone him down, and so they, they limit supplying uh, his weapons that they're going to supply to him to basically just defensive weapons. On 17th of March, Stalin and Kim meet, and they sign a cultural and economic, or cultural and economic treaties as well as a secret military assistance treaty. This is March 17th, 1949. And the Soviets immediately begin sending, supplying the Korean, uh, North Korean army with weapons. North Korea begins a reunification strategy by reviving communist insurgents in South Korea. So they have communist insurgents that are trying to stir up the, um, the South Koreans and reinvigorate the communists in South Korea. When Ri arrested two leaders of South, the South Korean Workers' Party, Kim realized that the only hope for reuniting was not going to be like a diplomatic or a, dem dem a democratic reun reunification. It was going to require a war. 1950. In a New Year's Day speech, Kim called Ri and the Republic of Korea a puppet of the United States. In the spring of 1950, Kim goes to Moscow and talks with Stalin and asks for support. And Stalin said, I'll give you support, but you have to also get support from Mao in China. Now remember, the, uh, Mao had just defeated the nationalists in China. And they both reluctantly agree to give support uh, to Korea's military idea. So, Stalin sent, sent military advisors, and Mao sent veteran Korean troops uh, who had fought in China's People's Liberation Army. There were about 35,000 of them that he sent to Korea. The North Korean armed forces had a significant superiority over the Republic of Korea forces. And the number of troops, it was two to one. Uh, guns, two to one. Machine guns, seven to one. Submachine guns, 13 to one tanks 150 to zero, and planes six to one. So North Korea is, is not only has more people, but they're better armed than South Korea. Korean War, 1950. Okay, Korean right, we signed an armistice, but the war is officially still, still going on. So on June 25th at 4 a.m. on Sunday morning, 89,000 North Korean troops attack across the 38th parallel. North Korea claimed that it was responding to a South Korean incursion into North Korea, which actually was a lie. It was not true. South Korea put up a brave defense of Seoul, but by June 28th, 
uh, Saul had fallen for the first time. It's going to fall four times, or change hands four times during the short Korean War. Um, President Truman, who was actually in Missouri, rushes back to Washington and consults with his national security advisors, then quickly sends a message to his UN ad ad ambassador to ask the Security Council to request that member nations send troops to defend South Korea. Now, last month we, we took a quick look at the United Nations, the founding of it, and if you remember, the Security Council was really the only uh, organ, as it's called, within the United Nations that has uh, potential for military power. Um, they can um, order troops, UN troops, into uh, military zones. Um, now, the Soviet ambassador, ambassador Yakov Malik, was boycotting uh, the Security Council and therefore was not in, in a position to veto the UN vote. He was, he was boycotting um, because the uh, Security Council um, had ceded um, Chiang Kai-shek's nationalists on Taiwan rather than Mao's communist forces in mainland China. So uh, Russia had walked out of the Security Council and they're boycotting it. They never did that again. That turned out to be a mistake. Okay, the Korean War. Now usually when I go up on stage with my microphone, the speakers blow me off the stage. So we're going to try it though. So, it's pretty blurry up here. Um, obviously, Korea. So, this is June to November 1950 on the, in the left-hand map. And North Korea forces, of course, attack across on June 25th, reaching Seoul by June 28th. And then, uh, by September 1950, they were actually pushed the South Korean forces down to Pusan. Okay, just this little bit right here, and they're controlling almost all of the Korean peninsula um, and really threatening. So Truman and the United Nations, so this is going to be a United Nations um, uh, war, if you will. It's actually not a declared war. It's called what? Anybody know? It's a police, police action. Very good. Police action. We rush troops in to Busan. But MacArthur, this is Douglas MacArthur, has come up with a plan, and that's an amphibious landing at Incheon, which is right here, which he does on September 15, 1950, a massive amphibious landing, quickly takes Seoul. The North Koreans, many of them are actually trapped in the south, but have a very long supply line, and they're really stretched, their army's really stretched. So he very, very quickly is able to push the North Koreans, uh, taking Pyongyang up to, up and near the Yalu River um, uh, by November 1950. And this is the, the line that is uh, reached by the UN troops by November 1950. Now, if you remember, we talked about this last month about MacArthur. Truman had said, and the UN mandate was that um, the fight, the, the, the UN troops were only to re, um, was to basically free North Korea, uh, South Korea, and, and back to the 38th parallel. MacArthur is politically, he's saying, this is ridiculous, we're here, Let's take, the, let's take China, okay? So he will start to bomb uh, forces, because North Korea has actually put forces across the Yalu River. What he doesn't know is that China has lined up almost a million men on the, uh, on the other side of the Yalu River. So in November, uh, when the United States bombs across the Yalu River, 900,000 Chinese forces flow across and push the United Nations forces back down to this area. This is Seoul, so it's actually south of Seoul, Korea. 
um, in, in 1951. The UN forces then uh, re-established their strength and are able to push back. And by 1953, there's a stalemate that's going on, uh, which will eventually uh, reunite them uh, on at the 38th parallel. Okay. And we, you said United Nations forces, but it was really virtually just all the U.S. soldiers, wasn't it? That's absolutely correct. Yeah, that's absolutely correct. It was under the auspices of the United Nations. There were U.S. forces, there were Canadian forces, there were British forces. Um, I don't, and probably some other countries too, but almost all of them were the United, United States, absolutely. Any other questions? Yes, ma'am. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. They, they were, you know, kind of, you know, left for weeks without, you know. A absolutely. The, the fighting was absolutely fierce. There were, there were, there, and there's been a few movies about this, some books. It's, it's called The Forgotten War because it actually had, not that much has been written about it or uh, it never became popular in the American culture. The Americans, I think, were sick of World War II or glad we were in the 50s when life was seemed pretty good in the United States. Let's not think about another war. Um, and um, so we, di we didn't hear much about it, but it, the fighting was, was, was horrific. Yeah. Oh yeah, I know, yeah, yeah. And of course, and of course um, we have um, a famous American uh, from Concord, well he wasn't from Concord, but he, he lived most of his life here, um, who um, just passed away. Uh, yeah, Thomas Hudner. Yeah, our Nat, uh, Medal of Honor winner. Um, and uh, ter terrific book on his life. If you haven't read it, you should read it. It's really great. And the, they were recalling a lot of men who'd been in the reserves. Because I know my sixth grade teacher, all of a sudden he, he was called back. He, absolutely, yeah, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. There was a, um, a man who some of you uh, might remember, Mr. Whiting. What was his first name, Jan? Paul. Paul, Paul Whiting fought in, and he's passed away now. He was a custodian in the Concord Public Schools, probably worked in this building at one point or another. He had fought in World War II, the Korean War, and Vietnam. And when he was still alive, he only passed away maybe 10 years ago, at the parade, the Patriot's Day Parade, he was the guy who was about this tall and weighed about 75 pounds, proudly carrying the American flag in the parade. Just a terrific, terrific man. He'd been called back. And he'd been called back, yeah, right. Yeah. yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So we don't have time to do the Korean War in, in a lot of detail, but we you know, obviously really appreciate the service that the Korean veterans put in uh, into the effort without a lot of recognition. Okay, the armistice. After three years of war at great cost in terms of money and human life, an armistice ending the fighting was signed on July 27, 1953. Now, Eisenhower in the 1952 uh, um, uh, election uh, said, I will go to Korea and end the war and end the fighting. That was one of his major campaign promises, and he went to Korea and, and ended the fighting. It's, it's a, it wasn't that simple. He just didn't show up and say, okay, the fighting's over. You know, it, it was lots of negotiations, not unlike the negotiations for the Vietnam War, very frustrating, but eventually an armistice is signed. Now, Ri, Sing Mon Ri, is very upset about this and actually tried to undermine the, um, the armistice by, without letting the United States know, starting to fight again. And so that went on for several months until he finally was forced to accept it. One of the major sticking points, and somebody had asked this question last month when we were talking about the Cold War, was about the exchange of prisoners, which was one of the big issues during the discussions. And in the end, uh, more than 22,600 communist soldiers declined repatriation, 
More shocking, though, was 23 Americans, one Brit, and 333 South Korean soldiers also declined repatriation. Um, and I, you know, I know there's discussion where they forced to, to not repatriate or not, but um, it, it is kind of interesting. And as I would mentioned, it's referred to as the Forgotten War. For Koreans, though, the war hardened the divide in the South uh, between anti-communists uh, and, um, and democratic uh, capitalist uh, segments in the South. And this is going to lead Syngman Rhee to, to really clamp down on, on anti-communists and really clamp down on democracy, um, basically limiting civil rights to many of the citizens. This is going to be a theme throughout the uh, South Korea uh, for quite a while. Um, and uh, I was actually shocked in researching this, how little democracy at times actually existed. There was, uh, there was martial law, which we're going to look at in a minute. So Syngman Rhee is going to remain in power until 1960, constantly Worked, he constantly worked to consolidate his power and force new laws, as I just said, limiting political opponents to challenge him. In 1960, I think he's 84 years old and is forced out. The Second Republic. There's going to be, as far as I could tell, five republics in South Korea. This is 60 to 63, and Rhee's first republic comes to an end when the National Assembly votes a new constitution, creating a parliamentary cabinet, similar to the British cabinet, system where the president is just a figurehead, doesn't have any power. The new government was short-lived, though, when protests by students and others due to the poor economy led to chaos across the country. So a coup was going to take place. It's a bloodless coup, but it's still a military coup in May of 1961, resulting in General Park Chung-hee dissolving the National Assembly, forbidding any political activity, and he instituted martial law and a curfew. Park, in taking control of Korea, gained popular support by his reign of virtue, as opposed to the reign of terror, when he arrested criminals and gangsters, and this is self-titled reign of virtue, and paraded them through their, to the streets on the way to their execution. Okay, and if you remember, <laughs> The French Revolution, they used to parade the people through the streets on the way to the guillotine. Um, he created the Korean Central Intelligence Agency, the KCIA, and placed all Koreans under surveillance in South Korea. Modern South Korea. And again, this is really very, very brief. In 62, under pressure for, from the, um, the U.S., it says for the U.S., it should be from the U.S., to end, military, to end the military regime, a new constitution was adopted, creating once again a strong presidency with a very weak legislature. Park was elected president in October 1963 in a very close election. He remains in power um, and in, in 1972, he declares martial law and changes the Constitution, allowing him to become permanent ruler for the rest of his life, except the head of the, KI, the KCIA, the Korean Central Intelligence Agency, assassinated him in 1979. Now, I guess it was a year ago, year and a half ago, Park's daughter had become president of South Korea and she was impeached for corruption. So the Park family has been powerful. South Korea's economy began to improve in 1965, so now we're going back to when, when Park is in, in office here, leading to a higher standard of living and increased popularity for Park. This is why he's being reelected. South Koreans traded freedom for bread Okay, um, basically saying, oh, we've got a good economy, we've got something to eat for the, you know, steady diet for the first time and, and you know, a long, long time. It's okay if we limit our voting rights and whatnot. We can live with that. South Korean um, economy was based on foreign investment, cheap exports based on cheap labor. They improved education, 
And so Korea could offer an intelligent and motivated workforce, which was very um, favorable to foreign investors. Industrialization grew up in Seoul, in Seoul and around the country in major cities. And they're now, of course, a, a major industrial uh, supplier. So foreign investors poured in and, and put a lot of money in the Korean economy really improves. Now, in 1953, the United States and the Republic of Korea signed the Republic of Korea Mutual Defense Treaty allowing U.S. troops to remain in South Korea, which of course were still there today, and President Trump's talked about pulling them out. Um, we'll have to see, which the Koreans are actually very much against. Uh, the U.S. has provided the Republic of Korea with billions of dollars in economic and defense aid throughout the years. North Korea. So after the Korean War, North Korea was faced also with massive post-war political and economic challenges. Kim's failure to obtain his war aims in, 19, in the 1950-53 Korean War actually really weakened his position as premier and some of the factions within the uh, Korean Workers' Party challenged him. Well, he's going to take a book right out of Stalin's uh, playbook and purge you know, thousands of people, which means arrest. And he actually held show trials, just as Stalin did in Russia, and uh, executed his rivals. Kim's power came, again, from the mass membership of peasants, 12 to 14 percent of peasants actually belonged to the Korean Workers' Party, so he had a wide base, it wasn't just the elitists. And they owed uh, their special privileges as party members directly to Kim, and he made sure they knew that, okay? Um, so, anyway, um, the um, North Korean industry, had, oh, uh, excuse me, I missed a big part. The, the regime built a cult of personality, cult of personality around Kim. Now, if you remember when we talked about Russia uh, or the Soviet Union, the Soviet Union had built a cult of personality around Lenin and around Stalin, basically replacing religion with the figures of Lenin and Stalin and um, really... Um, Everywhere, everywhere throughout society, um, the Lenin and Stalin were praised and, and really and it's taught in schools and every, all over. So this cult of personality allowed him to arrest and execute party members who had challenged his power. Now, North Korea had suffered terrible destruction of its industry and infrastructure during the war. So Kim, again, follows Stalin's uh, model by concentrating on building heavy industry and collectivizing the agriculture. And he nationalized in 1956 uh, all industry and agriculture in North Korea. Now, the, it's similar to what Stalin had done. You build heavy industry, you collectivize agriculture. What don't you make? Consumer goods. So just like in the Soviet Union, there was a real shortage of consumer goods. The same thing is going to uh, take place in North Korea. By 1950, or in 1956, Khrushchev, and we talked about this last month as well, had, was denouncing Stalin as a dictator and attempted to remove Kim from power because of his reliance on his cult of personality and his harsh treatment of uh, the people, harsh economic and social controls. Now, why would Khrushchev do this? Khrushchev is trying to modernize uh, the Soviet Union, trying to make it more acceptable in the eyes of the world. He wants to be able to trade around the world uh, and have communism be an acceptable form so more people would be, would, would, the West wouldn't fight against it as much and maybe things would open up. So that was his, um, his motivation. The plan fails, though, because Kim is simply too strong in North Korea. By 1962, Kim had removed all Soviet Koreans from positions of power, uh, which cost him uh, most of the aid that had been coming from the so uh, Soviet Union, from Russia, financial aid. Okay, Juche ideology. 
So Juche, which emanated from North Korea's militant nationalism, comprises of four concepts which are related to ideology, politics, economy, and the military affairs. Now these four concepts include self-determination, independence, self-reliance, and self-defense. If you think about it, those are the norms, the political norms in the United States, right? We, we pride ourselves in you know, self-determination, in independence, independent thinking, relying on oneself. That's why unions are, people had turned away from unions for so long or fought their creation of unions. They said, well, you're not self-reliant if you belong to a union, um, which I'm not saying is true, but that that's was the argument against them. This ideology is a combination of socialist and nationalist ideas, and it's close to being a state religion. This is going to explain, I think, quite a bit as we understand this, the control of the Kim family. Juche is the sole ideology incorporating both foreign policy and domestic issues. Any other ideologies are considered to be heretical, okay, to be anti-religion in a way, okay. Juche is said to be contained within the body of the great leader. Now, Kim is the great leader. His son was the great leader, and Kim III is the great leader. His brain is the control center of Juke and makes decisions and commands actions. So Juke, he lives Juke, and this allows him to be the great leader with all this wisdom and power and to be all knowledgeable, okay? Juke, according to North Korean beliefs, was passed on from Kim to his son, Kim Jong-il, and then to his son, Kim Un, uh, Jong-un. It is used to solidify power within the Kim family and within the country to prepare North Korean people for the transfer of power from father to son. It's a dynasty. It's basically um, a, um, a dictatorship. Um, and, and a dynasty uh, at the same time. Okay. The state of Kim Il-sungism. Okay, after eliminating rival factions, North Korea basically became Kim's kingdom. Kim's word became law, all policy debates vanished, and the Workers' Party simply became an instrument to carry out his instructions. North Koreans live by the slogan learned from the glorious revolutionary tradition founded by comrade Kim Il-sung, which guides North Koreans in every aspect of their lives, both public and private. From the late 1950s, Kim isolated North Korea from the rest of the communist bloc nations, but kept Stalinism alive. So he didn't care so much that the Soviets cut off power. He doesn't really pay that much attention, though, though um, uh, Un is now to China. From the late 1950s, Kim isolated North Korea. Oh, I just said that, excuse me. Kim's cult of personality influences all mass art, mass media, art, literature, and music, and all are pressed into the service of praising Kim. The fatherly leader. The most striking uh, Kim Sung ism is the notion of Kim as the fatherly leader. The regime tried to disassemble individual families and clans, replacing them with the idea that the entire society is one family with Kim as the father's father figure. The official explanation is that human beings receive their natural life from their biological parents, but, they're, but they are also social beings which they re, uh, receive or derive from the great leader. As the parent, Kim deserves veneration from his children out of devotion to him and must faithfully discharge their duties. After Kim Il-sung's death on July 8, 1994, North Korea officially adopted the slogan, Kim Il-sung is Kim Jong-il and Kim Jong-il is Kim Il-sung. They actually... Um, say that uh, Kim Il-sung is 
basically, it's almost like he's still alive. His power is still there, and he still exists as the great leader. Kim Jong-un became the great leader in 2011 at the age of 27 when his father died. Complete power transfer, uh, Kim Il-sung on the left, Kim Jong-il on the right, on the death. In the 1980s, I think it was 1984, Kim Jong-il wrote on the Juche uh, idea, which is basically a treatise explaining Juche, which in the treatise it says that only the great leader can interpret what the Juche actually means. Um, but it's kind of like the little red book you know, that Mao used. Um, and, and this is what they teach in school, and, they, and everyone has to know this, this information. <laughs> <laughs> uh, didn't hear so, so, so much about Kim Jong Un being corrupt. How is uh, his uh, father and grandfather all in line? Were they fair to the people? Were they fair to the people? Yeah, if uh, you know uh, the, if mm -hmm. the government is run by sort of a strong man, but if he is, he is not corrupt. Well, uh, Korea, North Korea is, is, is a police state, the, probably the worst police state, you know, that's almost ever existed. Um, when you say corrupt, in a way he is. I mean, he, uh, the, the Kims lived in unbelievable luxury. Um, and uh, everyone else is starving to death, basically. If, if, if you are in trouble with Kim's regime, your family's in trouble for two more generations. They're locked up. Um, so it's, it's, in that way, it's, it's corrupt. Certainly, it's not a, a, um, an enlightened government where the government's supposed to serve the people. The people are supposed to serve the government in that way. Um, I only had one connection with North Korea, and it was kind of kind of creepy. I, was, I played in a rock band, and we, we were on YouTube quite a bit, and we actually got a like from North Korea. <laughs> and so the band members and I were three history teachers and a former student, uh, and uh, were there like, what does this mean? You know, and so we start to think about it. Well, who has access to YouTube in North Korea? Okay, only the top, top political elite. I mean, the top of the political elite have access. And um, so it was nice to have another fan, but it was a little <laughs> creepy to think that that had occurred. Um, let's go on. The, um, yes, go on. Uh, for more information, I, I read the history of Korea by Jin Wong Kim. Uh, for this is where I got my information. As I said, I learned a lot. Uh, you know, as a history teacher, I knew the basics, but you don't get into real, real depth because you just don't have time uh, in in teaching history. But if anybody's interested in that, it's a terrific, it's a terrific book. The first half of it is all on the early history and all the different dynasties. I'd almost skip up to, the, uh, to uh, the 19th century um, and in the 20th century. So a discussion. What do we know about North and South Korea in the 21st century? And I'm just asking you to, I know we've run a little bit long, but if you, have, if you can remain and you have a few things to say, I would love to hear, uh, hear about them. Yes? Oh, uh, let's get the microphone. Okay, so really speak loud then, because there are people of harder hearing. Okay. Um, the first time that I became involved with North Korea was through my mother, who was a very good Methodist. And every Christmas, she wrote a check to her uh, nephew, who was a missionary, 38th parallel. 
So every year, that check would be written and it would be sent to the missionary nephew. So that's my interaction with North Korea and the 38th parallel. <laughs> okay. I, I want to introduce Phil Gott, uh, Phil's uh, close, close friend. Um, and he was a, uh, just retired. Um, you can see the smile on his face. And uh, he um, was an international automotive consultant, uh, very well known. Google him, goes on for hundreds of pages. But um, the, uh, he, did, he did quite a bit of business in, in South Korea with, with Hyundai. And so he, as generously offered, if somebody asks a question to help me answer it, or he could give. And I have a microphone to hand to you. So yeah, and he's also in charge of the microphone. That's the only way I could get him up here to do this. So someone else, Charles, you had raised your hand. I wanted to comment that I heard a lecture from a psychiatrist who interviewed the uh, prisoners of war who came back from North Korea. There were several facts that I brought out, that he brought out particularly. A very significant fraction of the prisoners of war would just go over in the corner of their barrack, lie down, and decide that they were going to die, and within a couple or three days they were. Furthermore, the ones that came out uh, were entirely different people. Uh, a normal soldier would go to town with his buddies and they would enjoy things. If the soldier actually, prisoner of war, actually went to town, he'd by himself. Hmm. They were separated. And the whole morale was, was different. Uh, there was a group of Turks who were captured. Mm -hmm. And the interesting thing about these Turks who were captured they had a leader, and when the Korean said, who's your leader? He's your leader. They isolated him. Who's your leader? He was isolated. Finally, they put them all back together again. And when the Turks marched, Turks were released, they marched out in formation. Hmm. They had maintained their discipline through the uh, North Korean time period there. Another thing that the North Koreans would do, would, they would take the people out and lecture them for hours yeah. at a time. Yeah. And then go back and insist that they ask what questions of them and answer, had to answer them in the North Korean uh, ideology. It was a terrible situation and sewed up very definitely in many years afterward. Yes, yeah, and the, the brainwashing was, was well known and documented. Judy. I'm saying the Manchurian candidate. The Manchurian candidate. Yeah. It sort of follows that same thing. It does, yeah, yeah. It's a movie from, I guess, the 60s, but excellent. If you haven't seen it on brainwashing. Yeah. Right. Steve. Yeah, I was just kind of curious. Louder, please. I, that I don't know. Do you know anything about that? Yeah. Does anyone? I think most of them came back. Most of them eventually yeah. came back. Yeah. 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 I'm. I'm sorry. I don't really know. But great question, though. It would be interesting. Again, I think the Forgotten War. So even that wasn't covered to the point of of other other wars. Anyone else? John, it's, it's an interesting observation, and, and your lecture has uh, really a broader lesson, I think. Uh, when I was working with Hyundai, I found the people to be very, very proud uh, of their culture and of their organization, and rightfully so to some extent. But it was, they were so proud that they found it very, very hard to take advice from an American about the American market. They felt that what they had learned in Korea was equally applicable here. 
And it, then they hung on to that belief tenaciously. And if you look at the history of the presidency of, of Hyundai in North America, you see that they were really only successful during the period of John uh, Krafcek. Uh, John was an American from Ford. And at the same time that he came in, we and strongly encouraged the people in Seoul to have faith in whoever was in, in the head of uh, Hyundai North America. They knew the market. And I now understand from your lecture where that came from. It came from the terrible oppression of the Korean culture by the Japanese and others throughout history. And you know, if you, we, we have um, a lot of attention these days on immigration in this country. And one of the interesting things is that immigrants appear to us in some ways to be different. And it's not, and it's due to their background and culture just as the way we act and interact with everyone else is due to our experience. And so uh, your lecture has helped me understand that in order to really get to know another person and work with another organization from another country, you need to understand their background. Good point. Thank you. Anyone else have a comment? Doug. Mr. Gifford. I think he's got a loud voice. Yeah. <laughs> Speak up a yeah. loud. Uh, just a couple more personal uh, comments about people. I, I know one uh, engineer in the 60s worked in Korea. And he said in the winter time, it's cold. He would wear coats and gloves. And he would go to work you know, on the upper floors of this uh, uh, building. When you went into work, you kept your coat and gloves on because there was no heat. And the buildings were just so cold, it was freezing inside and outside. Now, that's a remarkable change. I'm sure conditions are different now, but in the 1960s, they were severe. He said that was how it worked. And the other comment I think I read about the industrialization in Korea and the fact that there is quite a lot of corruption now within the industries and that uh, one man had been appointed to go to Korea and had a lot of work in the subway systems which were a lot of construction operations and he was assigned as an American he was assigned a woman as his uh, administrator and interpreter he wasn't well acquainted with the language and, and during the meetings, uh, everybody spoke in English, except now and again they break into Korean. He, he did not understand. And they would tell the administrators, interpreter, no, no, don't interpret this. <laughs> and they would talk about the connivance and the, you know, the irregularities that they proposed. And she was told not to say anything. Well, during the meeting, he, he didn't know, so he would go back to his office and she would say, you know, this is what they were really talking about, mm -hmm. even though we're speaking English. So there is quite a, uh, you know, the, the manipulation within the industry. Talk about corruption, I'm sure it's common in other areas, but it was well known that this situation existed. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Doug. Another comment that you reminded me of, and an example of how fast Korea has come forward is, you know, you go to Korea today, and they have heat. They're a very, very modern uh, society. They have, uh, all the comforts at home that we do, at least in the major cities. But in the 1970s, some of my colleagues, John, you remember, uh, Harry Matthews, perhaps, and Don Herter, went to uh, Korea to advise uh, one of the manufacturers, uh, I've forgotten which one, uh, as to how to move their product line forward and, and improve manufacturing. The best job in the entire organization was in the foundry. And why was that? Because in the wintertime, they would take a very large chunk of steel, heat it red hot, and then with a crane, place it in the center of the floor of the foundry so the workers could go over and warm their hands 
uh, and, and the rest of them as well, uh, with this glowing uh, several tons of iron. But as you said, it's uh, the uh, 5G now has reached Korea uh, in their in their phone systems. Highly technological. I think it's the most uh, connected uh, country in the world. I believe now through technology, through cell phones and whatnot. I guess that's an improvement. <laughs> well, I want to thank you all so much. Oh, sir, do you have some questions? Do you feel that South Korea or North Korea do want to join as one country? I, I don't have enough expertise to, to give a learned uh, answer to that, but I do know that um, the family unit is a very, very powerful force uh, among Koreans, and many of them have family members, although distant, on the other side of the 38th parallel. So the people want to get together. Uh, I think the government has a bigger problem. Yeah. Yeah. And how to do that. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Oh, the 2018 Olympics. Um, uh, oh, sorry. Oh, no, 2018 Olympics. But that was, um, pretty successful. Was it close to? Was the, that 88 uh, or or 2018? Last year. I think it was. Oh, last was yeah, that in Korea? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I should I should know that. I just. Was close to. I think it was around Seoul, wasn't it? Which is. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so, so that's in South Korea, but, but yeah, yeah, South Korea, right? yeah, yeah, but but not far from the border, yeah, yeah. Well, thank you so much for coming. Thank you. Next month we're we're back to the second Thursday, and the topic is the Middle East. So um, you know what I'll be doing for the next month. <laughs> Thanks so much for coming. Bye bye.